Listen for a word of God from Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 7, and this is the new revised standard version. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask. The word of God. I had a problem once upon a time here at this church. The microphone, they put on my ear the microphone, the one they adjusted before worship would not stay in place all the way through, right? If you've been here a while, you might notice that the media crew would try some different things, tape, more tape, different tape, different wire, different microphone, different ear. Does this help? Does that help? If you've been around a while, you know that, 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 that move that the pastors sometimes do, the ever-slipping microphone coming off the ear, and we nonchalantly put our fingers up while we're talking and squeeze it together as if you don't know what we just did. Such a casual little move. One day after worship, one of the elders came to me, leader of the congregation, and said, how much? Tell me how much it will cost. I cannot watch this any longer. You and that microphone. How, how much? Just tell me how much. I'll write a check. Can't they find a microphone that fits you? You get this microphone positioned on Sabbath, and then the space is actually shared. At least twice a week, the university family gathers here, rehearsals in between, musicians from both campuses, Many times a week, the microphones come out of the closet, they get adjusted, put on other people, they get put away. So by Sabbath, when we pull out the microphones, these earpieces are stretched, expanded to fit the ears of someone else. They bend. The bend in the microphone, it's super critical to a personal fit over the ear. How much? How much will it cost? It's, it's not specifically the money, I said. Multiple time, the space is shared. I explained the story. Not all the microphones are made to fit the same way. Not all my microphones fit women's ears. There's some truth there we could talk about. Nevertheless, this elder persists. Just tell me, tell me. And a, and a new microphone was ordered. This is why for many years, if you entered the media storage room here in this closet in the back hallway, you would find this little gem that said, Pastor Chris's mic, do not touch. Take this in for a moment, church, because handwritten instructions aren't sufficient for everyone. There will always be someone who will ignore the rules. So it's in bright yellow tape. And if that's not enough, you can, uh, you know, either direction. If you pick it up from this side, there'll be another instruction. Pastor Chris, only don't even let your fingers touch this little case. If you're even tempted, there's double warnings, bright yellow tape. David Johnson, our media ministry volunteer leader, he would tell you, no matter which way it's laying, you would understand. Don't you dare touch this. Leave it alone because it's not yours. It's mine. It's not ours. <laughs> it's mine. The language of mine, tell the truth. You know this language. And also tell the truth around your home. What do you have labeled in your home? Do you have cords that look like this? I mean... Look, mine, because people come to visit and they pack up and they leave and my cords are not always left behind for me, right? What do you have labeled around your house? When is it we learn this language anyway? Well, what's it called? The toddler's creed? This language of mine? If I like it, if it's mine. If it's in my hand, it's mine. If I was playing with it, it's mine. If I take it from you, it's mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's mine. If I'm building something with some of the parts, it's all mine. If you're playing with it and you put it down, it's also mine. If it's broke, it's yours. As we begin to learn we're separate individuals, the concept of possession and boundaries develop, and very important, the idea of agency, yes. Me and mine from the earliest ages specifically means not you and not yours. Practically speaking, get your hands off. We have in front of us a prayer beautifully crafted, intentionally organized, not empty phrases, not excessive words, not simply something to memorize or recite, but something over which to think deeply beginning with the first word, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. 58 words. Which words catch your attention? Drop a comment where you're watching today. Which words capture your attention? Get a journal and begin a prayer journal as we study this prayer together. Underline and highlight what words are critical and primary and necessary and anchoring for you as you read this prayer. 58 words. Which of them need some unpacking? Which of them would you prefer not be included? I'm stalled on the very first word, our Father in heaven. It literally translates the father of us all, our, not mine, not yours, our. And not even one of us, the father of those of us listening today, not even the father of those of us who can hear my voice today. This is the word that stops me in my tracks, our. Let me name some things to keep in mind throughout these weeks before we stand still with this one very first word of the Lord's Prayer. Some things to keep in mind. Number one, no one dictated this prayer word for word. This is Jesus remembered. Number two, the prayer comes wrapped in a heritage, multiple heritages actually, Israelite tradition, Greek-speaking Jews, Greek-speaking Greeks and Romans. There's a heritage to this prayer and it's wide ranging. Ideas about deities and humans and how they interact. We inherit our ideas about God, including our prayers. Someone taught you how to pray. What prayers did you inherit? What language did you inherit? People taught me how to pray at home and my grandparents, probably my grandmother is where I learned the line and make us fit for heaven someday. I learned prayers from home and school and church and social circles. That's my prayer heritage. The Lord's prayer has a heritage too. Number three, Christian disciples pray this prayer, but what makes it a Christian prayer? Because it's in the Bible? Think about our Christian faith for a moment and all that is central to us, right? Jesus, born of a virgin, the cross, the empty tomb, the resurrection, the centrality of the scriptures, the Sabbath, a literal second coming, the great doctrines of God and human nature and the Trinity, and we could keep going. So much that is central to the Christian faith is not mentioned in the one prayer Jesus teaches us to pray. What are the implications? This is prayed by Christians, but what makes it a Christian prayer? Number four, Jesus is a Jew, yet this is also not a Jewish prayer. Watch for the Jewish layers and thinking, however. Number five, the prayer is not like a psalm which cries out to God or the prophets who cry out for God. The prayer is somehow an intersection of something else. What is that something else? Number six, Matthew 6, Luke 11 record this prayer Which version is earlier? Which version is more accurate? Which would have been closer to the way Jesus prayed? Which translation gets it right? Let's confess this early on that only the King James Version carries that final doxology for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Only the King James and only the Gospel of Matthew, right? I I know all the KJV people are saying, "Mm mm-hmm, see, this is why we read King James, And all the musicians are saying, that must be why that song is in an Albert Hay Malat. Malat. Um, You know, it gets difficult about around page five where that doxology takes off with full fingered chords that move so quickly. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Which version of this prayer is closer to what Jesus prayed? Keep these things in mind as we move the next weeks. This is Jesus remembered The prayer comes wrapped with a heritage. What makes this a Christian prayer? What, how is this distinguished from a Jewish prayer? It's not a Psalm or the prophets, what is it? And we have Matthew and Luke telling the story. If you've been listening carefully, especially during our shelter at home weeks early on, when we've prayed this prayer at the end of worship, you you will know that I say it differently from week to week and the media crew isn't quite sure what words to put on the screen until they hear what comes out of my mouth. Remember, this also happened to the scribes editing so long ago. They adjust the written words sometimes to match what they hear people saying and reciting and we're not troubled by this. This is truly what makes our Bible our Bible. This is truly what makes it more stunning for me that God allows humans into the process of telling God's story. Hold these ideas over the next weeks 
And now come back with me to the very beginning of the prayer, our Father in heaven. Jesus does not haphazardly speak of God as ours. This is the one and only time Jesus speaks of God as ours. In fact, the only place in the Gospels where Jesus directs his disciples to speak of God as the God of us all. The God of us all? Usually when our Father is referenced by Gospel storytellers, they mean one of the patriarchs like our father Abraham or our father Jacob, our father David. The Apostle Paul refers to God as our Father, but not Jesus. This is not Jesus' usual language. It's a bit of an anomaly, which is why I pause. Remember the scene on resurrection morning when Mary and Jesus are together. This is in the Gospel of John. And Jesus says to Mary, stop holding on to me. I'm going to your father and my father. That's about as close as Jesus gets to describing God as belonging to more than one or two of us. Why not simply say to Mary in that moment, stop holding on to me, I'm going to our Father. He doesn't. Does it matter so much? Sitting on a hillside that day in Matthew's gospel, Jesus instructs the disciple with crowds listening in, and he gives them a prayer that is so much larger than what the disciples could or would ask to pray. Why not teach them to pray to your father and mine in that moment? Or why not teach them to pray to the father of those of you willing to follow me? Or the father of those with religious loyalties who actually believe in a God? Or to the father of those of us who really long for God to solve the human crisis? Why not teach the disciples to pray to the father of us who take scripture seriously? Or the father of us who treat people by the golden rule? The father of the Christian faith I'm about, about to act out. The first word out of Jesus' mouth is this declaration that God is not the God of me and mine, and God is, God is, in fact, the God of ours, the Father of us all. We're a community of siblings. It's not our human nature that binds us, friends. It's our divine birthright. It's not human nature, divine adoption. It's not human nature, it's divine lineage. We are bound together because we're children of the Holy One. So we must address our prayer to the heavenly parent of us all. How different this prayer sounds if it begins with simply father or parent or heavenly parent. Drop the plural communal pronoun, our. Some of us pray our private prayers this way. Dear God, dear Father, Abba, Father. That's all right. Jesus insists in this prayer, however, that his students address God as the God of us all. The toddler creed is real, and here is the pushback. This is not the God of me and mine. This is the God of us all. I sent my brother a text message on Sunday during the football game, right? There's a football game. The Cowboys are playing the Seahawks. I sent my brother a message. Please tell me. Please tell me when the home team is playing that you root for the Hawks, right? See, my father taught my brother to love the Dallas Cowboys. I never understood this. We're from the Northwest. Why do you cheer from a team from Texas? My brother would always tell me, it's an American team. The Dallas Cowboys represent America. So I sent my brother a message. Please tell me when these two teams are playing today that you are cheering for the home team. Of course, he answers me back quickly. Of course, sis, absolutely. I knew who my team is. And also, you and I may differ on politics, but we'll always be together with our teams. And we can chuckle and raise an eyebrow and exit the conversation in love. I remember years ago listening to my daughter when a basketball game was going on, and I heard her explaining to her friends, oh, it's my mom who taught us to be haters. <laughs> and everyone laughed. You know, we cheer against a basketball team. And everyone laughed it off, and we wore our red and black and white jerseys, and I sat there saying, did, did I? Did, did I teach them that? Did I teach them that only me and mine? One step from me and mine is to teach hate to give. We shrug it off and we kind of go back to eating our snacks and we drop the conversation, drawing lines and sides and boundaries. I've been curious about this for years, actually. The Homestead Act in this country is passed in 1862. The Homestead Act meant you could have land if you were willing to live on it. You could have 160 acres, by the way. Move into a neighborhood, put your stake down, put your fence up, and call it your own. 
And within 60 years, Americans had gobbled up 80 million acres, had gobbled up so much land that Native Americans were actually forced to go live somewhere else. And maybe that's the birth of neighborhoods and neighborhood zoning and regulations and policies for who's allowed to purchase land and belong. No wonder kids learn early how to decide who sits at a lunch table. It used to be, in, if you served in the nation, in this nation as a civil servant in the House or the Senate, you left the office and you went to a boarding house close by and you took your shared supper meal around a table and you laughed and told stories. You knew the names of your colleagues, family members. You would retire and have after dinner drinks in the room next door. You would tell jokes and go to family celebrations. You would laugh and cry together. You'd get up the next day, return to the nation's capital and become the civil servant for this country again and do the work of the people. There's a book on my shelf from years ago that explained this to me. I've never forgotten the big sort. We live in a country clustered with like-minded people for the past four decades, more like. We live in a zip codes with people who think like you and value what you value and share lifestyles and beliefs. This is not the red and blue states map from the year about 2000, no, no. Zip codes and communities and neighborhoods and street by street now so that people somehow cluster with those who are very similar to them and have a difficult time understanding people who live two zip codes away. Social psychologists studying group dynamics for more than a century now, they tell us that it, it's been going on a while. We think it's an election year dynamic. The big sort has taken us a lifetime. Now it's simply fueled and flamed in new ways. Like breeds like, like-mindedness polarizes. Difference tempers, diff differences temper and moderate us. And these dynamics, they change us. Last week, I spoke of a documentary, Social Dilemma. A major point in that film is that there are now third-party unseen manipula manipulators using us and shaping us into more segregated, less civil, less tolerant siblings. On Tuesday night, when some hoped the rest of the world wasn't watching, I reminded myself that to pray the Lord's Prayer means I am in a family unit with the people at the microphones who are representing our shared American life. I'm in a family unit with humans, even if their humane nature is buried somewhere. Sometimes my humane nature isn't showing so well either. Where are the forces in your life pulling you into a more segregated reality, more tribal reality, less open to human sim siblings? What makes it difficult for you to pray the first word of the prayer, our Father? What made it more difficult to pray for all the property in the Napa Valley this week and not only the Adventist-owned property as we heard people reporting so grateful to God miracles that were done? Have you been able to check the dissonance as the denomination gave thanks to the God for miracles of buildings like Pacific Union College and Elmshaven that were saved from the destruction while thousands of displaced souls weep and mourn? The earliest usage of the Lord's Prayer, we think, was for the ritual of baptism, when candidates were instructed on the prayer before baptism, simpler, similar to the baptismal studies we do now. They are instructed on the prayer before baptism, so when they come up out of the water, the prayer can be prayed thoughtfully and with intention. You didn't actually pray the prayer until you studied the prayer. Listen to a pastor from the third century. I do not say, my father, or give me my bread. Our prayer is a common and collective. And when we pray, we pray not for one, but for all people, because we are all one people together. It's not I who pray for me, it's we who pray for us, another author says. Or, you may pray it alone, but you are never alone when you pray it. If we want to be honest to Jesus, we can't pray this prayer on Sabbath, leave worship, and then nurture the toddler's creed the rest of the 167 hours in our week. I can't pray the Lord's Prayer and then nurture differences and hostilities of difference that don't allow me to close the gap between me and Jesus. The mandate to pray to our Father, the heavenly parent of us all, comes from Jesus. The church prays this prayer not for its own private instruction. We pray the prayer as a testimony to the heavenly parent whose goal is the restoration of all of us, not simply those who recite a prayer. 
Here's how the letter to the Ephesians would summarize it. Ephesians 1, verse 9, For he has made it known to us in his wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purposes, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. God's intention is to gather and unite all that belongs to God, which is all. All are begotten and all are adopted. And we know this, as I've been saying, but maybe we don't know this. So Jesus teaches us to pray in advance for all God's children God pursues. The ones who irritate and the ones who offend and the ones who deeply offend and the ones we've completely blocked out of our minds and the ones we are ignoring until the election is over, the ones we've simply forgotten because our hands are so full with today's worry. Jesus is clever. I'm going to give you a prayer you can't even pray without also naming every human sibling in one word, our If I want to be honest to Jesus, the most basic question I might need to ask myself is, where did I learn to be against human siblings, and how do I unlearn this? How do I unlearn monogrammed, initialed, labeled, separated lives? How do I unlearn primary loyalties of this world? This is not something I can simply subdue. It's something I surrender. We won't take these steps by willpower, friends. The first word of the prayer is a large confession that I'm not capable of meaning what I say. I need help. How do I know? Because this is precisely what I'm working on these days. You cannot will it out of our lives. We release it to the almighty heavenly parent who hears our prayer. It is actually the spirit who prays this prayer in us and for us. There are options to the toddler's creed. I think it was Pastor Austin when he joined our team years ago. I remember him creeping across the room during staff meeting and taking my computer cord, the one that says me and mine, and unplugging it from my computer and taking it all the way down to the end of the table and plugging it into his with a big smile on his face and he sat back down. And ever since then, when a new team member joins our team, I'll sometimes have to say to them, oh, this is how it works around here. You'll you'll see us moving the cords from one computer to the other. They belong to all of us. What are the ways we unlearn the toddler's creed? With one word, Jesus teaches us to pray that our sibling status will be restored. Maybe if we pray it, we will long for it. And maybe if we long for it, we will work for it. Uh, but I get ahead of myself. That's for next week. Amen.